Okay, good. Awesome. So we are live now. So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining join us once again for another session in Reyes. Um, for those of you that are new to Reyes, welcome. And this is a remote, remote experience for young engineers and scientists. For those of you that do not know me yet, my name is Orlando Ayala, and I'm an associate professor in the engineering technology department here at Old Dominion University. Today, I will be serving as the moderator for the engineering session titled Biologically Inspired Robo Robotics from Animals to Adaptive Machines. It is pretty amazing to see how robots have been evolving in the last few years. Um, it, and it's even more amazing to see that they can replicate what animals do. Well, our speaker today is an expert in that area. He will entertain us while teaching us on the current state of the art of the topic. And our today's speaker is my dear friend, Professor Krishna Kaipa. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineers at Old Dominion University. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India, and his master and PhD degrees from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. He did his postdoctoral research at University of Vermont and University of Maryland. His research interests include biological inspired robotics, which is the topic of today, collaborative robotics, autonomous vehicles, swarm intelligence, and robotics in education. He received his best master and PhD degrees awards, best paper awards in international conferences. So he's really good, I can tell you that. <laughs> Dr. Kaipa chaired ASM Engineering Conference Committees and currently serves as an associate editor for Journal of IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters. And I'm not even, I'm not, I'm not even short on what I'm saying, that he's really good. He's a very good friend of mine. He worked, we worked together in certain projects and he's really good and he's really, really humble. I'd like to work with him. Now, we will start the presentation that will last about 30 minutes. We then will switch to questions from the audience, but feel free to start sending questions as you listen to the talk. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, Professor Kaipa will answer as many questions as possible during the last part of our segment. Now, without further ado, here's my dear colleague, Professor Krishna Kaipa. So Krishna, please take it away. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ayala, uh, for such a wonderful uh, introduction uh, of what I do and uh, about myself. Uh, uh, good morning, all. Uh, so my talk today, I've titled this, titled it as Bio-Inspired Robots uh, and how we uh, take inspiration from animals and go from there to adaptive machines. And when I say adaptive machines, I refer to uh, uh, robots uh, that uh, walk and crawl like uh, uh, animals and insects. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's see what it entails. Uh, <clears throat> So Dr. Ayala already introduced me as uh, assistant professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And also I direct the collab collaborative robotics and adaptive machines lab here. Uh, so let's jump into the uh, talk. Uh, before entering into bio-inspired robotics, I wanted to give you the landscape of traditional robotics uh, where we mainly use purely engineered solutions to different tasks. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm mainly focusing on locomotion, meaning like meaning uh, um, meaning like moving from one point to other point, just like you see some vehicles here that are uh, that have mobility. So that is locomotion. Uh, so purely engineered solutions to locomotion depend on wheels uh, in uh, ground-based uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, then rotors in uh, UAVs and manned aerial vehicles uh, for basic propulsion. Uh, so that's what you see here, unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned underwater uh, surface vehicles, uh, aerial vehicles, and so on. So these are, this is the traditional landscape in robotics. Uh, however, uh, biological inspiration entails how we take, uh, we look at, we study animals, insects, how they evolve uh, distinct traits to perform in uh, reliably in a variety of unstructured environments to adapt to different environments for survival and other uh, purposes. Uh, and then like take some ideas, uh, copy those ideas into uh, design of uh, robots like you see here. 
uh, I can you can see some examples of a gorilla inspired robot or a uh, or a lizard inspired robot, uh, a turtle inspired uh, crawler or a self writing robot that you see uh, on the uh, extreme right. Uh, the take here, I mean, the message here is how uh, bio-inspired ins uh, insights uh, are mainly used to synthesize uh, locomotion and manipulation capabilities in ro uh, robotic systems. Locomotion meaning like uh, mobility and manipulation is actually like handling of objects. Like uh, uh, if you want to like uh, grasp co complex objects, then you want to take inspiration from a uh, human hand to build a, uh, to design a uh, robotic uh, grasper. Uh, and for source of bio inspiration, uh, you have the entire, uh, the entirety of animal kingdom, vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, the, the examples that you can see here, uh, if you want to build a robot that can, uh, uh, you know, propel underwater, maybe you can uh, take inspiration from fish, uh, how uh, the fish has several control surfaces uh, and how it uses undulations to generate uh, forward thrust and so on. Uh, for a robotic gripper, human hand, and so on. Uh, so while we have all this uh, kind of uh, resource uh, uh, resources for inspiration to build uh, uh, robots for different applications, uh, the main aspects that we look for, that we try to copy are, uh, uh, one is like morphology. Uh, morphology refers to like the body structure of the, uh, of the animal like how the, uh, let's say locomotion is our focus, then how the legs are attached to the uh, body structure. Are the legs like, you know, like how you see in lizards, are they like moving like sideways? Are they closer to the ground? Or in like cats or dogs, or even us human beings, uh, the legs, we, uh, they move in a vertical sagittal plane. And these morphological differences uh, lead to different capabilities in, in animals. Uh, so that is one primary aspect that we try to copy into uh, robots. And then you have biomechanics and control aspects. So today I'm mainly, we'll, I'll be focusing on the uh, body structure of the animal and how we see that in different uh, robots, some examples that we see here. Uh, so uh, for more formally, uh, morphology refers to the overall body plan of the natural creature that is chosen as the inspiration source, like you see on the right, you have a lizard. So then we try to copy uh, first, like the structural aspects, like how the uh, legs are like moving like sidewards. I have an example here, uh, for example, uh, so this is a robot uh, inspired uh, from a lizard. So you have these like legs moving like sideways like that, right? And also like the aspect ratios, like what's the ratio of length from, uh, from the head uh, to uh, to the rear uh, to like the side lens, right? So these are aspect ratios we try to copy into the uh, robotic structure. Uh, so all that refers to the kind of kinematic structure of the body. Uh, then uh, morphology also involves like geometrical shapes, aspect ratios, and then something called compliance or stiffness properties. Like we have, even as like, you know, in our muscles, we have like, like some springy properties, which we try to copy into robots. Uh, and then there are some uh, certain limbs that are specialized for propulsion versus those specialized for manipulation uh, and so on. Uh, one example is like how uh, if you take like the, uh, you know, uh, a monkey's tails, they are like prehensile. They're able to like hold on to branches versus some uh, tails of some like crocodiles or alligators. They're not, they are non-prehensile. So that's what we mean by how some limbs are specialized for manipulation, some are for some other uh, propulsion purposes and so on. Um, so the, the reason morphology is important is because it determines whether the animal can operate in a particular environment or not. And it also impacts how well uh, uh, it is uh, adapted uh, for a particular uh, like uh, survival in, uh, in certain uh, envi harsh environments. Um, so exactly like how I explained, you can see the lizard family, the, like, you know, the hands, the legs are moving sideways versus like cats or dogs actually you have like a cat inspired robot here, uh, where the legs are like moving in a sagittal plane or more in a vertical plane. Uh, right. uh so let me show some examples of robots that take, uh, where inspiration is taken from some animals like that and copied into, uh, 
uh, robots. Uh, so the theme that we follow here is uh, first, uh, in a course I teach on the topic, uh, students like they first like get to get up to speed on uh, the kinematics, like uh, the mathematical fundamentals of, uh, uh, of the robots, like uh, uh, what's the mapping from how much angle uh, at the joint to how much movement is made at the uh, foot and so on. Uh, and then they uh, take inspiration from some animal, uh, then make some rough sketches, then go from there to like uh, 3D printing uh, or make first like even like making CAD models of those uh, of those uh, ideas. And then we go from there to 3D printing, uh, assemble the robots and so on. So let me, uh, in the interest of time, let me play the video and they are like kind of self-explanatory. Um, So I'm trying to. Uh, what, it what happened? Popped up here. Like, uh, should I? Oh, it was here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see an example of a uh, Komodo dragon inspired robot. So these are the CAD models that first in Lexima on a computer. And then those models, like we 3D print them, assemble them into robots, like you see here. Uh, you can see the robot replicating the game dragon or a giant lizard. So that's the sloth inspired robot. So here you can see some of the things I was mentioning, how in some robots, the, uh, here it's very obvious, the uh, legs are moving like sideways and it's like closer to the ground. So it has more static stability and so on. And the uh, robot is using a trot gait. So uh, uh, what kinds of gates animals use. So this is a gorilla inspired. You can see in a gorilla how the hind legs are shorter than the front legs. So that's like replicated into the robot. And it's also using a gait very similar to how gorilla walks on four, uh, on the four legs. So here you can see the challenge of like first, like uh, taking the inspiration and going from there to actually building the robot. Once you have that, then uh, you can see each leg has a set of like two servo motors. So uh, four legs to totally like eight servo motors. So now you have this challenge of programming the gate uh, or the co coordination between different servo motors to achieve the, those gates. Uh, and uh, some uh, observation here, uh, what can help us in doing that, uh, achieving that motion. If you look at the uh, you know, foot of uh, each leg, it's like a bow shaped trajectory. Like, so there's a stance face and then uh, the leg moves like that. Uh, so we first uh, look at what's the goal, uh, what's the foot motion and then kind of uh, reverse engineer what, what are the angles that you need to provide at each joint. So you get that desired motion. And then some uh, you know, face relationships between different legs and that's how you achieve the... Uh, part. Thank you. So here is another semester. Um, and again, I'll be speaking here so you could just watch the inspiration, the inspiration part. Nature offers examples of animals and insects that evolved distinct morphological, biomechanical, and control structures. These traits enable them to adapt and navigate reliably in a wide range of unstructured terrains. Robots can achieve similar adaptation capabilities by copying some of these crucial elements into their designs. Students in this course on bio-inspired robotics learn concepts like kinematics and dynamics of popular robotic configurations 
while using biological inspiration and 3D printing techniques to engineer quadrupedal legged robots over the course of the semester. This is just an introduction to this fascinating field of robotics. Students from this course can move on to do more exciting work in other interdisciplinary fields like soft robotics, biomimicry, and autonomous robotics. So that was the first time I taught the course here several years ago. Um, and then uh, you can see how uh, in a course uh, like environment, students build robots like uh, uh, for walking and so on. But in research, we kind of uh, try to achieve more complex uh, feats or tasks. For example, uh, in this uh, project, we tried to uh, build a robot that could uh, that achieves uh, uh, amphibious capabilities, meaning like uh, walking on land and swimming in water. And for that purpose, we took inspiration from freshwater turtles because they are reasonably good uh, swimmers. Uh, and also they can morph their like legs to achieve like walking on land as compared to like sea turtles, which are, which can only swim. They're like probably the fastest swimmers in the sea, uh, but they cannot walk on land while you have like tortoise or terrestrial turtles that can only walk on land, uh, but not, but they don't have swimming uh, capability. Uh, so if you want to like the, uh, build a amphibious robot, uh, then maybe like freshwater turtles are like a good uh, source of inspiration. And that's exactly what we uh, tried to do in this project. Uh, and uh, using like, uh, uh, of course, like going from prototype one to prototype two, and then we uh, uh, try to uh, understand, try to address different questions, like what kind of mechanisms achieve amphibious propulsion uh, efficiently, like without splashing water, or uh, how can we combine actuated and passive elements into a single mechanism uh, to, pr uh, to produce amphibious propulsion and so on. And also we, uh, we tried different uh, configurations, uh, different uh, material uh, like uh, combinations, thickness and, and uh, several uh, parameters to achieve, uh, to optimize locom uh, locomotion performance. Uh, so some prototypes here that you can see, I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through the uh, like lot of like theoretical details, but like actually show you uh, like how these perform uh, and then focus on the main aspects. Like for example, amphibious uh, uh, prototype that we built here while walking, it, it uses a particular gate, but when it is in water, it switches to a diagonal gate. So maybe that's like the first thing we could look at uh, here. For example, like uh, uh, while walking, it was using some gate, like a diagonal, I think, yeah, a trot gate, but when it's in water, like it uses some kind of a uh, parallel gate. So, And you can also see how we go from, when we go from the first prototype to the second prototype, the, the design is like more matured. We have like understood the mechanism of uh, uh, the amphibious turtle more uh, and you have better performance. Uh, so these are some like showing like uh, different gates, like trotting gates, uh, trotting gate, and then the gate used for swimming. Um, and then how, what kind of uh, optimization we do with different, uh, so all these are like design variants. Uh, for example, for flap axis, you could either use horizontal or vertical. For flap hardness, you, you have different values. So here, this kind of, in this kind of analysis, we are, uh, we are trying to come up with that combination of uh, parameters like flap thickness, flap hardness, and so on, that, give you, that gives us the best like uh, forward uh, thrust. So if we use that or the average force, so then we do this kind of detailed analysis, like maybe put a sensor in the uh, robot that can uh, sense the thrust and then uh, use different combinations here and like, see like where the uh, force is peaked and maybe use that combination of parameters in the actual construction of the robot. Uh, so this is like, uh, of course, work I did when before coming to 
Old Dominion at Maryland uh, University of Maryland College Park. Uh, I thought this is an interesting uh, prototype or a design to uh, look at. RoboTerp 3 is the third generation of the University of Maryland's robotic Terrapin series. RoboTerp 3's new three degree of freedom joints enable faster swimming and better maneuverability. Unlike other amphibious robots, RoboTerp 3 has the ability to swim against current. The rotational shoulder joint mimics a real turtle by allowing RoboTerp to transition from swimming to walking. So that's the aspect I was mentioning, how freshwater turtles have uh, capability of swimming. And when they are on land, they're able to morph their structures in a way that enable them to uh, perform like uh, walking. Uh, so if you see while swimming, they had a particular like stance of their uh, of the uh, legs, but when on land, they were like slightly uh, oriented. Uh, shoulder joint mimics a real turtle by allowing RoboTerp to transition from swimming to walking. The next interesting uh, robot is a self-writing robot uh, where we took inspiration from a uh, horseshoe crab. Uh, so horseshoe crabs uh, use a uh, intelligent like combination of uh, their uh, shell and the telson movements. Uh, so whenever they are like, uh, like they're toppled, they're able to like move in ways that enable them to self-write and then like uh, uh, start crawling. So that's exactly what you see here. And it's a good capability for, uh, uh, for robots to uh, have. Uh, whenever they get stuck, let's say you send a robot to Mars, to a Martian environment, and rather than us from here trying to uh, bail the robot, if the robot can uh, detect that it's, it's like kind of stuck and uh, self-write itself, uh, then that's a good capability to have. Uh, so we looked at different uh, you know, animals and uh, you know, uh, creatures that have this capability. So then we uh, found like uh, horseshoe crabs display that uh, uh, feat. So then we, uh, you know, we, we did that, meaning like uh, uh, copied some of the aspects of uh, horseshoe crab into a robotic crab. Uh, and for that purpose, we actually took the uh, scan of a real like natural horseshoe crab. And then like uh, uh, you can see, we used a thermoforming technique uh, to make the shell for the robotic crab and also achieve movements. Uh, so I'm going to skip through the, uh, the theory here uh, because the actual, uh, how it achieves the feat is more interesting. Uh, we can focus on that. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also see how nature already solves this problem. For example, if you like try a box configuration, you'll never be able to, uh, you can never able to, you can never be able to self-write not a uh, configuration which is like a fully spherical, uh, but na uh, so nature has evolved a particular intermediate geometry that enables this, uh, this task. Uh, so that's another take here. Uh, uh, when, whenever we engineers, we sit to solve problems, uh, maybe like there are solutions, but they are not like uh, uh, optimal. So then when we look at uh, how, biology or nature has solved it, we may find uh, interesting and alternative solutions, which we then try to copy into robots. Um, so, or, or you can, uh, you know, uh, think this way, well, uh, the solution already exists, like how would we like copy that into the robot? Right? Uh, so that's the process you see here, uh, as much as possible, uh, we try to faithfully copy the features into the robot. Um, there's uh, volume spots. A new okay, surf zone so robot is inspired by horseshoe crabs, which are built for effective surf entry with minimal mass and power. 
the walking gait was developed from the mechanics of horseshoe crab walking, which uses the vacuum form shell for support and the legs for propulsion and granular media. In the event that the wave forces or turbulence invert the robot, it is able to dynamically sense and correct its orientation on regular and irregular surfaces using its telson. So basically it has the needed electronics and processing and also sensing. So it has a tilt uh, sensor that will tell the robot like what's its angular orientation uh, that uh, uh, from which it deduces that it, it's kind of toppled. Uh, so it applies the uh, needed moves, which uh, in a transition to an upright posture and then it like continues to like crawl forward. Okay, so this uh, now like transitioning to a slightly different, uh, uh, say, uh, you know, domain where we take inspiration from infants or like how uh, babies, they uh, learn skills, complex, increasingly complex skills by imitation of uh, their parents or their caregivers. Uh, so here, uh, this, the field is called like social robotics, uh, where uh, robots are able to combine uh, self-exploration, like where robots are uh, performing some trail and error themselves and combining combine that with what uh, they observe in other robots. So this field is uh, also goes by name of, names of learning by imitation, uh, programming by demonstration. Uh, so here, uh, rather than manually programming the task into the robot, uh, you just show the task to the, uh, you know, how to perform the task and the robot is able to like observe the action and uh, imitate that first. And then in the process also like learn to perform the same task in different situations. Uh, so, uh, so that's the uh, uh, topic here. And we have done some initial work where uh, a robot is able to uh, use similar uh, like strategies as how a baby is like making like uh, models of what, what it looks at, uh, correct? Like when the baby is born, even the vision is like very blurred. Uh, so it uses like simple models like cubes and uh, uh, spheres and so on uh, to model like what it is looking at and like try to make a sense of that. Uh, and it also has sense of like something called proprioception. It's able to tell uh, already uh, right after birth uh, correct. Like, for example, if it's even if it closes its eyes, if I move my arm, like how much angle uh, uh, the uh, uh, the arm has moved, right? So that's called proprioception. So it's able to use this uh, like uh, self perception and what it is observing uh, to learn like uh, uh, different tasks. Uh, so that's exactly what you see here. So uh, just to you know get an idea as to. How this is again different from traditional robotics is in traditional robotics we actually program the uh, so the uh, the structure of the robot first is programmed into the robot which is referred to as the kinematics uh, meaning like uh, there is a uh, mapping from like angles at different joints of the robot to how, what mo movement it makes but in this paradigm the robot is figuring out itself, like uh, like its bodily connections. So that's the self-discovery phase where it uh, figures out its bodily connections. And then you can see uh, like there is a physical robot and a simulation of itself. Uh, the simulation can be likened as like uh, the mental rehearsal, like of how, how we uh, like, uh, you know, uh, like try to uh, uh, rehearse certain actions and so on. Uh, correct, and then it gets so it gets like a builds a model of itself, and then it's looking at another robot and like tries to make uh, uh, a sense of what it is looking at. Then uh, in a third phase, it's like uh, trying to imitate the action of the. Uh, so we also use terms like uh, the baby is referred to uh, the as a student robot, and whoever it is learning from or uh, taking the instructions from. So that's a teacher, right? So student is imitating the teacher and uh, learning from the teacher. Uh, so there's also an area of uh, called like neural network. So, uh, so a small neural network is used here in this phase, uh, which enables the uh, student robot to like match the actions uh, or to learn what it is observing and match the actions of the teacher. 
so that is, uh, you know, um, I mean, if you have uh, questions here, I can definitely. Uh, so you will, you will see that it doesn't look anywhere close to that of a baby, uh, but then it's a simplification where we try to, uh, we just say the uh, robot just like it has some like main body and maybe just two limbs. Uh, correct. And then what you do is like uh, uh, it, uh, you send like random commands to different uh, joints of the of the limbs. Uh, and then like there are some sensors that enable that uh, uh, you get a reading of how much tilt and so on. Now the same set of commands is also uh, are sent to a simulation model, uh, correct? And then those simulated, uh, so then you are like uh, evaluating an error between uh, the, uh, the values or the uh, measurements you get from the physical sensors and uh, simulated sensors. And then you try to minimize this error by like adapting the modifying the models until the errors are zero. So at that point, you say that uh, the robot has learned its own like bodily construction. Right. So uh, so that's the process you see here. So this is a simulation engine again that can simulate like the physics, the collisions, and so on. So you can see initially. Uh, you know, the concept uh, it has of its body is like the legs are connected in some weird fashion. But uh, as uh, as the simulation evolves towards the end, it, it kind of uh, uh, converges to like it, the physical uh, self. And then there is a phase where it is watching another robot using like two cameras and like making some visual models. Like I was telling how babies use blood vision, correct? Uh, so in this particular experiment, it actually like uh, it's just making a deci decision uh, who is a good teacher to learn from. Learn from, correct? Uh, so that's the field of uh, you know learning by imitation. It's uh, mainly like theoretical in nature than like what I explained earlier, uh, but it's I just wanted to like introduce uh, a topic like this too. I was also mentioning like uh, this uh, field or actually Dr. Ayala mentioned that I have interest in this field called collaborative robotics. So here we mainly look at uh, the role of collaboration between robots. And there is a whole spectrum, uh, you know, uh, here. On one side, you have something called like swarm networks or like where you take ideas from uh, like social insect societies, like how ants, you know, they are able to like, uh, uh, it's a large collection of ants. Uh, each uh, agent uh, doesn't have much intelligence, but when they act in a group, uh, they, uh, they seem to demonstrate some uh, intelligent behaviors. So that is like utilized to solve like complex tasks. So that's like collaboration among like a swarm of a lot of uh, several agents that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you can also, uh, you know, uh, leverage complementary uh, strengths of humans and robots, where a human and a robot is collab are collaborating to perform a task, just like how two humans collaborate, right? Uh, so that's the focus in like collaboration, uh, collaborative robotics, um, and some of the focus in my uh, research. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, is it a good time, time to stop, uh, Dr. Ayala, and maybe it's up to you. We we have we have the full hour. We just oh right 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 yeah, so, yeah. But, but we have to. Yeah. We already have some questions by the way. Yes yes yes. Uh, so it's up to you. Right. Uh, so I can actually play this video. You know where I was talking about uh, this swarm networks. Uh, the task here is like you have all these like. Uh, locations uh, that you want to detect. It could uh, be like maybe a nuclear spill or something or a, like a chemical uh, leak in a factory. And instead of like one leak, let's say you have like multiple leak locations and you want to like uh, simultaneously uh, like detect all of them. Uh, so that that uh, task is challenging. Uh, and one of the algorithm I developed during my PhD uh, is uh, up, can be applied to a task like this. And that's uh, kind of like one example where the algorithm can be applied. Uh, so let me play that. And I think uh, it's an interesting uh, simulation to watch. 
So you can see here how uh, there are like three source locations uh, and then like a, a group of agents, they start from random locations. Uh, so the swarm, the algorithm enables the swarm to first like split into like subgroups and each of the subgroup is like uh, converging to one of the, is able to detect uh, the source location and kind of converge towards it. But here there are several challenges because you never know uh, where these locations, where these sources are, the distances between different sources and how many uh, such sources are there. Uh, so it is difficult to like set parameters like uh, how much range uh, each agent should have to enable like the connectivity between the agents. Uh, so here, uh, the main principle by which the agents are moving is like uh, you have the ability to sense the value of, uh, let's say, the leak at your own location. And then you compare that with that of a neighbor. And then if, you, if the neighbor has, has sensed more, uh, you know, uh, value than yourself, then you try to move towards that neighbor, uh, correct? Uh, now imagine like uh, you have access to all the neighbors, then meaning like you have a large uh, sensing uh, range. Then what happens is uh, like you saw in the first case, all of them like they converge to, uh, you know, just one of the several sources or for example, like the source that has like the maximum concentration, correct? Uh, but here the problem is the goal is to detect all of them. So then, uh, then we experiment with, okay, let, let me like reduce the sensing range to a slightly less value. Uh, then probably it'll, uh, the swarm will be able to capture like, uh, like multiple of them. But then here you can see the third one is like left out, right? So then you still further reduce the sensing range. Uh, then you see that all three are captured. But in this particular case, there are only like three sources. So uh, you can kind of, uh, you know, uh, keep changing these sensing ranges and then uh, detect all of them. But in cases where uh, you, uh, you, there, are, there are several spills and, uh, you know, and uh, it's like a random distribution, then you can never set a constant range. So this algorithm uses something called an adaptive range where it is like uh, uh, modifying the range itself. Uh, every iteration, depending on how many neighbors it has, right? So if it has like too many neighbors, then it will shrink the neighborhood range and only consider uh, neighbors uh, that are like, uh, you know, maybe three or four in a small neighborhood. Or if it is like isolated, then it will expand the neighborhood range. So it's able to, until it finds a neighbor. So connectivity is maintained. So when you use such adaptive capabilities in the swarm, then you see like uh, beautiful behaviors like this. For example, in this in the uh, in the picture here, uh, there are like completely locations are completely random, and then you have like ten sources, uh, but they're able to like nicely uh, split into like adaptive swarms, sub swarms, and converge to all of all the locations. So that's the uh, algorithm. It's a swarm intelligence algorithm and agents in the swarm are collaborating in certain ways, in decentralized ways uh, to solve a task like this. All right, so. Yes, yeah, so maybe let's, uh, I see like five questions here. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. I have some questions as well, by the way. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, <laughs> Let, yeah. Sh shall I go with this? Uh, uh, Curie Gregory has uh, had a question. Uh, can I just read and uh, try to answer? Uh, sure, yeah, I can read them for you, but and but if you want to go ahead, go oh, ahead. No, 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 please, oh. you read, you read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gregory, Gregory. In constructing the joints of the robots, should all the joints be copied from the animal inspiration or is it more practical to have the minimal requirements for intended motion? Wonderful question, yes. Yes, so if you look at the actual, even us human being, like, you know, our shoulder has like three degrees of freedom, correct? You have three degrees of freedom. Uh, the elbow has only one degree of freedom, correct? And uh, how, at the wrist you have, like, again, you're able to do uh, three uh, motions. That means three axes. Uh, so what you will see is uh, for basic locomotion, you don't need to copy the entirety of the joints. Uh, and in all the examples, you could see only like two joints 
and then even the ankle is like uh, simplified to just a point correct and then like the hip has only one degree of freedom rather than three degrees of freedom so it was just like uh, two that were per leg uh, so does that answer your question Gregory minimal so minimal uh, depending on the task, right? Uh, sometimes uh, you want like uh, to achieve locomotion on a more complex terrain, then you may want to increase, slightly increase the degrees of freedom to a point where it's uh, manageable control wise. And also it's able to like adapt, uh, like, uh, you know, stance posture, so it's stable and so on. So Gregory, you, if you need more, more deeper answers to that, just let us know. Uh, let's go for the next one, Andres. And his question is, do you use Arduino language to program yeah. robots? We use like Arduino, like each. Uh, uh, so I have this, uh, maybe uh, this is the point where I can show it's a cat inspired robot and you can see Arduino inside, right? Uh, also see, let me show you. <laughs> so that's the gate that the legs use. And you're right, so Arduino is used uh, in all these robots. All right, so let's go for the next one. And that's from Anchal Sassina, I think. Sassina, yeah. If, if, I apologize if I mispronounced. No, 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 it's good, it's good, yeah. Are the self-learning robots programmed with artificial intelligence? And how are they programmed? And does the code modify itself as the robot learns as it is, it is manual? Right, yes. Yes, uh, great question, yeah. Uh, so first we should uh, acknowledge that self-learning is, is one part of uh, one subdomain in the uh, art of artificial intelligence. Uh, so it is artificial intelligence. Uh, and then, uh, so that way, we, if you say programmed, yes, they are programmed under the AI paradigm. Uh, uh, and then like, uh, how are they programmed? And does the code modify itself? Yes, I did show you how, like there's a basic structure. You tell the robot how, uh, what's the approach to learn, uh, but the uh, uh, it is not modifying the code, but it is modifying uh, like the model of itself, uh, correct? So you, uh, you first provide a specification of the robot saying that it has a budget of this many limbs and the, and the possible connections between the limbs. And uh, if you just provide the possibilities and then it will search in these uh, combinations of possibilities and try to converge towards the optimal uh, combination of uh, limb connections and so on, right? So it's not code modifying the code, but it's modifying the model uh, of the robot, yes. Interesting, very interesting. Um, perhaps this is related to that question. So Nicolas Estervarios, how can you make a robot to be autonomous. <laughs> yes, awesome question. So, uh, so you saw all the examples where they were the biologically inspired robots. The gate is like manually programmed. Uh, you figure out like uh, how much each uh, uh, joint should rotate, like forty-five or thirty degrees, and so on, and just manually achieve uh, manual programming achieve the gate. But to in order to make the uh, robot autonomous. Uh, several modules are needed. For example, it needs to have sensing. It, it, has to, it has to be able to sense its surroundings so that it knows whether it's like bumping into an obstacle. Uh, so that is uh, the first uh, capability it needs to have. And then it needs to be able to locate itself with respect to some coordinate system, localize itself using again some sensors. Then it needs to like plan a path, right, uh, where to go, and just like a self-driving car or uh, and so on. Uh, so all these uh, modules are needed. Uh, like for example, like sensing, uh, path planning, uh, then like control. Uh, control is needed to like uh, some feedback control is needed. So you provide a path specification, but how does it uh, like use sensing information to like track that path? So that's the control. And some, of course, at some point like learning, uh, let's say it, uh, it encounters a situation which he has, has not seen earlier. So it should be intelligent enough to, uh, so all these aspects of sensing, then localization, planning, control, and machine learning are needed to make the robot autonomous. But uh, 
that's, that's a lot more uh, complex, but good, awesome, interesting. So Elsie Cruz Murrieta, this was an amazing presentation. The field of biorobotic is pretty interesting. So now is the question. What kind of tools do you use to model the kinematics of the biological structures on and in an actual design? Which by the way, that, that's gonna lead me to one question I have for you. So I'm gonna squeeze in question. We have many questions now, but yeah. I'd like to ask one question which is related to that. So in any case, what kind of tools do you use to model the kinematics of the biological structures to have for an actual an act, an act listen? Yes, yes. Yes, the first step we do is like simplify the, you know, some complexities in the actual biological uh, model, like simplifying the degrees of freedom and so on. And then like making CAD models first, deciding like where the axis of uh, uh, joints should uh, reside with respect to the main body structure. So that's the kinematic structure. Uh, right. So then uh, first you are trying to like simplify the complex. Uh, you don't copy the entirety of the biological animal uh, simplification, but to a point where it is still able to achieve the task, not too much simplification. Then like CAD modeling. Uh, okay. So then there's also like uh, aspect ratio scaling down of the actual, like, you know, so it doesn't, uh, it looks like that uh, animal a little bit. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I guess this kind of answers the question, but later there's also like a mathematics, uh, uh, like they say, kinematics is also a mathematics term, which essentially is uh, some kind of formulas or, or matrices that you need, which uh, kind of uh, map the joint angles or the set of joint angles at, uh, of several legs to the actual motion, uh, uh, Cartesian motion of the robot. Right. So, the, so you also need that uh, to be coded into the program. So then before we go into the, the next question, let me ask this in mind. So yes. now that you explain a little bit about that, um, on how to, to get the information from the, from the actual animal, how much time do you spend looking and learning the animal motion? Let's say you start from an animal, you have no idea how it moved. Yeah, awesome how question. Spend that then how much okay. time, how much time do you spend on okay. uh, designing the robotic mechanism, and then how much time do you spend in programming? Um, and this is of, of course roughly. Yes, sure, sure. Yeah, wonderful, right? Wonderful question. First, uh, I think the things to know are like wh what is needed in all this, like studying the animal locomotion. Uh, so in the class, I already teach them like, like, like uh, for example, I spend like one lecture on just the different gates of the robot, like of, of animals. Uh, for example, animals, they use like trot gate or abling for different speeds. When they're walking, they're using trot. And when they are like running, they're using galloping. So I, I already teach that theory, but then when they are designing their uh, robot, I ask them to watch lots of videos of that animal. Mm -hmm. Let's say for example, a giant lizard or a lizard uses uh, locomotion like sideways. Then I ask them to watch the videos of the animal, like how the legs are moving. Uh, because like when you keep watching them and uh, different videos, then you kind of get a sense of uh, how the coordination is achieved. Uh, so that depends then on the student, like how much, or maybe like, you know, may uh, spend a day or two just like uh, studying the locomotion of the animal. Okay. Uh, and then of course the, so uh, like, can we give like two days, three days on that? Like students spend time on that. I give usually like a weekly assignment, weekly. Uh, so I say like by next week, I would like you to like uh, come up with a rough sketch of the gait of the animals that you, that you have decided to take inspiration from. Okay. And then next, I give like two weeks to go from there to CAD model. Okay. And students who have already like, uh, some students have already done a course in CAD modeling. So those are the ones who come with like really good designs. Okay. Uh, but like, uh, I usually give like two weeks, uh, but then it also goes to like three weeks when they are, uh, and I have, I have to give, I do give examples from previous uh, semesters. Um, because there are challenges for students, like how do I design the motor mount or uh, how to fix the motor or, or couple between, coupling between the motor and the leg and so on. And, and what about the programming? So the last day, uh, programming, programming, programming uh, students use two approaches. One is trial and error. <laughs> for in the code, like for each leg, they decide, okay, so uh, 
And uh, Dragon Air is one of the best. The problem with that is that it takes a lot of time. A lot of time, yes. You learn a lot more. Yes, but of- some students, like for example, you know, Dr. Ayala, like we had like Julian um, in our in our group, like who took my course. She was probably one of the few students who actually use inverse kinematics. Uh, so while kinematics is going from joint angles to like the motion of the foot, inverse kinematics is what is needed to program the gate of into the robot. That is going from what is the foot motion needed? Uh, you know, so then you know so the coordinates, uh, the locus of motion of the foot is in terms of x y coordinates. Okay. That x y motion is mapped into the movements at each joint. And this mathematics is referred to as inverse kinematics. So you have the equations of the inverse kinematics, which you have to like code it into like- uh, In a room. Right. right. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Les, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. What is the greater scope in the future for this type of robots? Right. How many of you have watched like uh, the Boston Dynamics, uh, like, you know, cool. Of robots. Uh, that's pretty amazing, you know. They can do yeah. almost everything. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you, the first set of robots, you could see the big dog uh, was able to uh, achieve locomotion in a variety of uh, environments, uh, like uh, my uh, climbing mountains and uh, mountain mountainous terrain or, or rocky terrain, or like walking on like uh, like you know uh, slippery uh, like ice uh, uh, kind of surfaces. Uh, so even if you kick in the gut, it's able to stabilize, it's great. So such locomotion, uneven terrain locomotion helps, could help like soldiers, uh, like uh, carrying like lower payloads uh, in a, like a forest environment, they have to work or uh, correct. Uh, so the, like in, mil- so they have like such an uh, surveillance, uh, like military applications. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and even in surf zones, surf zones uh, and so on, right, yeah. Yeah, the, those videos from the Boston Robotics, that's, wow, that's crazy. Right, 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 yes. Yes, yes, I have, yeah, so shall, shall we go on, like move on, like? Uh, yeah, let me go for the next question from, by Syed Inayat Gul. Uh, right. he, has, he or she has a, a, another question. Are there any disadvantages of robots because there is always two sides of the coin? Mm-hmm. You told us the good side of the robotic, what is the bad side of it? And what are the ways that we can fix those disadvantages in robotics? So what's the bad thing about having robots, basically? <laughs> you want to answer that, Ayala? Like, you have any particular opinion? Uh, uh, this is, a, yeah, this is a good, uh, you know, like a discussion. Uh, for, of course, like, you know, there are uh, always, like, sometimes, uh, like, robots uh, are not that intelligent as human. They may fail in some situations. So those are like technical aspects. Uh, uh, however, probably you're talking about like uh, robots going and like taking over, like, uh, like you know. <laughs> and definitely, we don't want that to happen, right? You don't want that we to happen. So many, so, so many yeah. Hollywood movies that we see that happening, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, so the right direction to take is where uh, robots and humans like uh, complement their capabilities, uh, leverage the complementary strengths. Uh, right, so right now, like of any tasks that are like rote and mundane, uh, can be uh, kind of, can be take uh, robots can do them. Uh, for ex- one example, I can give is uh, in my research, we look at uh, how humans. There are some certain non-repetitive tasks, like uh, as simple as a maintenance task, like removal of rust. Correct. So that's like a very hard task, like uh, even now in shipbuilding industry or wherever maintenance tasks like humans, like they have to like take like complex objects and like remove the rust. So some of the research that we do in our lab, we try to uh, uh, develop technologies that enable robots to do these tasks. Uh, meaning it's a like a very like a physical task, uh, but still robots are not at there because once a robot performs a contact-based task, it's like highly complex, how much force it has to apply or how much springy it has to be and so on. So a right direction to go is where uh, humans and robots are like complement their capabilities and humans can be used for more like intelligent decision-making tasks, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I can see, I can see that complementing each other as, as you mentioned, definitely, which is, 
something that perhaps is related to the very last question by Andres, and, and we're running out of time, but we have two minutes that plenty for Dr. Kaipa to address this question. So Andres asks, are the robots programmed for only moving and correct their position if needed, or do they also have sensors to interact with the environment? Yes, yes, uh, yes, they do, yes. Uh, you know, there's several, I was just explaining the uh, task where a robot has to remove rust, then it has to have a sensor that takes back the force because uh, it doesn't have to, it shouldn't apply too much force or too less force, it won't be able to remove like a hard stain. It sensors to, uh, for that, uh, you know, to enable the robot to physically interact with the environment. Or let us say you have a robot just like a, uh, you want to do a study of how uh, a baby robot is like manipulating with objects around it. So then it has to have, it has to use vision, it has to use uh, like tactile sensors to make sense of its surroundings. And the sensing impacts the learning of the robot. Okay. Well, with that last question, I wanted to thank Dr. Kaipa for a great presentation and awesome Awesome, awesome presentation. I love it. I love it. This makes me realize um, how much this is. This is a, a lot more interesting. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you are with us in Raya. Thank you for accepting, giving us the talk, and 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 with that, I like to say bye to everybody. Uh, we'll yes. have a next session at 2 p.m. this this afternoon um, with a, an engineer from NASA. So we'll we'll I'm looking forward to see you there. And once again, Dr. Kaipa, thank you so much for your great presentation. Yes, yeah, I, my pleasure. And I thank you also, uh, Orlando, uh, my friend. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> it was such, yeah, it was for me too. It was like really uh, awesome to be here and uh, interacting with all the audience. <laughs> Definitely, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I will remember this. So, sure, Sunny FYI, we do have a 50 people audience here. And without yes. that, that's without including the ones that uh, we might have at, through the, our YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kaipa. I'll see you. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>